Today we're going to talk about thresholding. The prerequisites for this material are the short time Fourier transform and wavelets. We're going to focus on the problem of denoising. In real applications, measurements are always corrupted by noise. A simple yet useful model is that we may have a signal that we're interested in, and then there's some additive noise that corrupts it. And the problem of denoising is the, pro is the problem of estimating this signal from the noisy data. Noise is not always additive, it, this is important to point out, but additive noise is a useful, simple model to illustrate uh, denoising techniques that are useful beyond it. So we're going to use it in this, uh, in this lecture. So here we have a noisy image, which corresponds to this clean image, where Gauss, IID Gaussian noise has been added on top. And our goal is to re recover this image from those noisy data. It's not immediately obvious how to do this just by looking at the noisy image. So in order to inspire ourselves, we're going to uh, take a look at the wavelet coefficients of the noisy image. So take a look, and of the clean image. So now try to think about how you would exploit the structure that you see in the wavelet coefficients of the clean image with respect to the wavelet coefficients of the noisy image. In particular, what do you know it, notice? So you can see, so something important to point out is that if we have that the signal, so let's say that the data is equal to y and the clean image is x and the noise is c, when we look, look at the wavelet coefficients, let's say that they're equal to a y, because remember that uh, you can compute the wavelet coefficients uh, if you're using a hard uh, wavelet transform or some other orthogonal wavelet transport. It's, um, it's an orthogonal transform, but in general, it's going to be a linear transform. So we can find a, a matrix A such that AY is equal to the wavelet coefficients. Then because of linearity, the wavelet coefficients of the noisy image are equal to the, no the wavelet coefficients of the clean image plus the wavelet coefficients of the noise. Okay, and these guys are these guys. And here we see a y, which is equal to a x plus a c. And we already know that a x looks like this. So we see that a c is basically spread out all over the place. Whereas a x, we still see the contributions from a x that are very concentrated, are pretty sparse. So in general, what we notice is that the wavelet coefficients of the signal are very sparse and concentrated, whereas the wavelet coefficients of the noise are quite dense. Let's pause for a moment and think why are the wavelet coefficients of the noise dense? In fact, this, this is quite easy to see. It follows from um, properties of, uh, of random vectors. Let's imagine that the noise is Gaussian and has a certain mean and, and covariance matrix. Then when we apply the wavelet transform, which is just a linear transform, what's going to happen is that the mean is going to be multiplied by that same matrix with which we obtain the wavelet transform, and then the covariance matrix um, gets multiplied on the left and on the right by the wavelet transform. The thing is that our wavelet transform is orthogonal. So if the noise is IID, meaning that it has a diagonal covariance matrix, then the covariance matrix of the wavelet coefficients, which are these guys, uh, is just going to be A times the identity times A transpose, which is going to be also the identity. So basically, the wavelet coefficients are also IID, a Gaussian noise, if the original noise is, is Gaussian and additive. So that's why we see the noise spread out over the whole image, it doesn't really have any structure, which makes sense, right? Because why would the noise be aligned with the basis vectors of the uh, of the wavelet basis? It it would mean this. Uh, there's no reason to expect that that would be the case. Okay, so the thing is that we end up with this situation where the wavelet coefficients of the signal are sparse and the wavelet coefficients of the noise are very dense. So how would you exploit this to denoise? We have a situation like this where basically the signal manifests itself in uh, having like these high coefficients. Or oh, this, of course, uh, a cartoon 
illustration because there's more structure than just sparsity in the wavelet coefficients. We're going to talk about that towards the end of the lecture. But let's imagine that this is all the structure that you want to exploit. How would you exploit it? And of course, you know, there's a reason why the title of this lecture is thresholding. So yeah, we would just threshold out these guys. We would set to zero whatever is small and just keep the large values. This is called hard thresholding, where you pick a certain threshold that you could do, you could pick it by, by using some validation data where you have a good estimate of the, of the true signal. Or you, if this can be, uh, you know, you can simulate your noise on, on some uh, clean data that you have, and, and like that you could, um, you could set the threshold. But this might be difficult if you don't know what the noise is like. That's a real uh, challenge in practice. But let's, let's assume that we know how to set this threshold then. We would set uh, whatever is under the threshold to zero, and we would keep whatever is over the threshold. That's called hard, hard threshold. If we hard threshold this data that we have seen before, this is what we see. Of course, we still make a mistake on the entries that were large because the noise on those entries, we have no way of, of uh, disentangling it from the signal. But still, it's a pretty good estimate. Okay, so how do we do this when um, the sparsity is not directly, the signal is not directly sparse, but it's sparse in some transfer domain, such as the wavelet domain? Well, what we do is we apply, we, we apply the wavelet transform, we compute the wavelet coefficients, we threshold those, and then we come back. We uh, invert the transform, and that's going to be our estimate. So basically, we have this noisy image, we compute the noisy wavelet coefficients, we threshold, so we keep only the large ones, and this is our denoised image. Notice that we're keeping quite a bit of the noise here and a little bit here. This is because, uh, again, like there's this challenge of setting the threshold. You don't want to set the threshold so high that um, you don't really eliminate any noise. You don't want to set the threshold so low that um, you you cut you you actually eliminate um, part of the signal, and that's really a big um, a big challenge. Here we just did this with some cross cross validation, and that's that's the threshold that worked better, and that's the image that we get. Notice that there are some blocky artifacts. This is very common when you use hard wavelets because of the hard edges of the, of the hard wavelets. Using smoother wavelets would, would help with this. And we're going to see a bit later on uh, another technique that will help us to deal with this to, to some extent. Okay, so this is a comparison. Um, this is a linear denoiser based on a Wiener filter. We're going to talk about Wiener filters in, um, in the following lessons. But just so that you know, that's just a linear denoiser. The wavelet threshold, uh, thresholding actually does pretty well. Now we're going to apply the same technique to, to remove noise from a speech signal. Okay, this is going to be the same signal that we used when we introduced the short time Fourier transform. I'm going to play the noisy speech signal for you. So just give me a moment. So that was the noisy speech signal. And this is how the short time Fourier coefficients of the noisy speech signal sound like. This is the clean speech signal. So let me play the clean the clean audio for you. Can, 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 lo, lo, lo. That's what we want to recover from the noisy data. And this is how, um, what happens if we threshold the short time Fourier, um, the, sh the short time Fourier transform coefficients to try to recover the data. This is how the denoised signal looks like. So it looks, you know, closer to the clean signal. And uh, if we zoom in, we see that in fact, we have managed to remove quite a bit of the noise by thresholding the short time 
Fourier coefficients. Okay, however, I'm going to play you. So this is actually a good example of that you need to sanity check your results, not just by looking at graphs and so on, but actually either looking at the actual images or uh, when it comes to sound, actually playing the sound. So let's play uh, the result of our thresholding denoising. So there's good news and bad news, right? The good news is that we have removed quite a lot of the noise, which is actually quite obvious here that we have removed quite a lot of the noise. The bad news is that uh, it sounds uh, very strange. It sounds very, very strange. So I want you to think for a moment while looking at this threshold at short time Fourier coefficients, why it sounds like that. It has this musical noise to it. You can pause the video if you want, but do think about it. Okay, so if you've thought about it, um, the reason is that we have, because of the noise, I mean, we're trying to threshold so as not to kill the whole signal here. I should use another color. Let me use maybe green. So we don't want to kill the signal here by thresholding, so we don't want to put the threshold too low, but because there's so much noise around here, eventually some of the noise is, uh, you know, is left by the thresholding. In fact, a lot of it. And um, when, you re when you reconstruct it in terms of the short time Fourier transform, you re reconstruct essentially isolated small sinusoids because those are the basis functions for the short time Fourier transform. And when you listen to those sinusoids, they sound like tones, like pure tones. So this is why you hear this musical tone, musical tones when you do thresholding. Unfortunately, if you put the threshold so low that you don't have this stuff, then you kill the, the whole signal. So that's, uh, that's a challenge. So maybe you can think about how you would go about um, solving this challenge. So uh, the threshold with short time Fourier uh, transfer coefficients looks like this. This is how the clean ones look like. So maybe you can think of a different way, of, well, or how to adapt thresholding so that you don't have these isolated sinusoids that produce the musical noise. And there's not a single answer for this. So in particular, something that we're not going to explore but would probably be a good idea is to threshold, uh, you know, adapt your threshold as you go up in frequency, right? This is probably a, a, a very, you know, a very useful thing to do. In the case of wavelets, we have a similar situation where we look at the thresholded wavelet coefficients and then we look at the clean wavelet coefficients and we see that we have a lot of isolated wavelet coefficients that we're leaving there, I mean here for sure, um, that are isolated and they produce, so you hear them, see them here also, they produce those blocky artifacts that, that we that we noticed. And they are definitely not present in the in the clean image. So what kind of structure do you see in both the STFT coefficients and in the wavelet coefficients that we might be able to exploit to uh, denoise a bit better? So the structure is, I mean, at least, uh, so again, this does not have a, a single answer, right? But definitely structure that we might want to explore, uh, exploit is that the clean signal coefficients are very clustered. So what we could do is we could threshold them in blocks. You could go back here and say, oh, I'm going to not look at individual wavelet coefficients. Actually, I should look at the noisy ones, right? Let me go back and, and take a look at the noisy ones. Okay, I'm going to go all the way back because I want to explain the idea before we actually... Yeah, so these are the noisy coefficients of the noisy data. Sorry, I, I might have... Uh, I, I know it's annoying when I start like just flipping slides a lot. But sometimes I just can't, can't avoid it. Okay, so um, here the idea would be Instead of looking at each of these guys individually and saying, oh, is it larger than a threshold? I'll, you know, I'll, I'll keep it or not. What we're going to do is we're going to cut up blocks and say, oh, is this whole block larger than a certain threshold? If it is, I keep it. If it's not, I kill it. And the idea is that the parts that correspond to the signal, you know, they form these blocks that are all large together. Whereas here, even though there might be some individual 
coefficients like these guys that are pretty high, they're usually, I mean, it, it will be very unlikely for them to also be around other uh, noisy coefficients that are very large because the noise is very, is very unstructured. So there's very low probability that you're going to get clusters of high noise because of the fact that, as we saw, the, um, at the end of the day, it's also IID noise. Okay, like uh, you might be wondering why, um, like we, we actually assume that the transform was orthogonal to derive the fact that it was IID noise. But for the short time for your transform, you can prove something very similar and it just follows from intuition. The noise is very unstructured. There's no reason why it would be aligned with this segmented sinusoids, which are the basis functions for the STFT. And because of that, we are going to tend to only see isolated large values for the noise. They're not going to uh, cluster together like the signal. So yeah, so basically that's the idea. We would block threshold as opposed to threshold. Okay, let me go all the way back. So the idea is that we could threshold in blocks. So it again, like the, um, the technique is very similar to just thresholding, except that now we threshold according to a block of surrounding coefficients. So this is a set of coefficients that surround the coefficient, the jth coefficient. And we look at the L2 norm of all of those coefficients aggregated together and we compare them to a threshold. And again, the threshold, we would just set it according to some cross-validation procedure. Okay, so the idea is, again, super similar. Of course, we want to block threshold the coefficients, not the signal itself. So first we apply the transform. Then we apply the block, block thresholding operator. And then we invert the transform to obtain the denoised signal. So these are the noisy short time Fourier transfer coefficients. These are the thresholded ones where we keep all of these uh, isolated coefficients that produce uh, this musical, very, very annoying musical noise. And when we apply block thresholding, in this case, we've decided to use a block of length five. That's another um, hyperparameter that you could set by cross validation. Boom, we have eliminated all the noise. Of course, we have also eliminated part of the signal, but at least we're keeping, uh, like what we're keeping is definitely all signal. So let me uh, play to you. Well, actually, maybe I'll, I'll show you first how it looks. This is, remember that here, these crosses um, are the denoised, uh, the denoised signal by thresholding that you have to compare with the noisy signal and also the clean signal, which is in blue. When we denoise using block thresholding, the denoise signal looks much, much more similar to the real one. And in fact, I'm going to, so let me remind you what the noisy signal uh, sounds like. And now let me show you what the block thresholded signal sounds like. It's actually pretty good, especially when we compare it to the very annoying thresholded signal that has this musical noise. So block thresholding um, succeeds in removing these artifacts, these uh, musical artifacts, um, because of the isolated wave uh, short time Fourier coefficients that um, that survive. We're going to also apply this to the noisy wavelet coefficients. These are the thresholded wavelet coefficients, and these are the block thresholded wavelet coefficients. And the thing to notice is that we are basically preserving the structure a bit better. Okay, so here you see this compared to here. Okay, and we are also killing the spurious wavelet coefficients much better. So here there are some that survive, some that survive because we're thresholding in an isolated way. We threshold in a block in blocks, then those uh, disappear. This is the noise signal uh, using block thresholding. So now when we compare it, we see that certain features are much well preserved, much better preserved when we do block thresholding because we're um, exploiting the actual structure underlying uh, in the signal. 
Okay, so what have we learned? We have learned how to denoise using sparsifying transforms, such as wavelets and the short time Fourier transform. And we have also learned how to adapt the thresholding scheme to uh, account for signal structure. Thank you very much.